Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Welcome to Online Worship this Palm Sunday, April 5th, 2020, here at First Presbyterian Church of Bryan, Ohio. Thanks for looking in. Just want to remind you before we get into our worship time <coughs> that we're going to be sharing communion together at the end of our worship time today. So if you want to get some bread and some grape juice together for that time at the end of our worship time, I encourage you to do so so you can participate with us as we enter Holy Week together. Also, another reminder about our Tuesday free meal that's continuing. Tuesdays from 5.30 to 6.15, um, we're still feeding people. And if you know of someone who's struggling, somebody who's unemployed, um, you yourself uh, might be in need, show up. You just drive into the parking lot. Um, we'll bring the food right to you, and then you can take it home and you can eat it. So uh, we hope that you'll participate in that and also help somebody else discover uh, this ministry here in Bryan, Ohio. We're continuing um, my sermon series on um, Hello, My Name Is, based on names and titles for Jesus. Um, we've been looking at Jesus as the light of the world, Jesus as the bright morning star, Jesus as the good shepherd, Jesus as Lord. Today we're looking at Jesus as the suffering servant, um, especially as that relates to Holy Week and the events of the crucifixion um, and his entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. I want to start today with a quote. Um, it's a quote by an anonymous author. I don't know who originally wrote it, but the words I find incredibly challenging. And he wrote, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for strength that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life so I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered, and I, among all men, am, am most richly blessed. I find a lot of power and inspiration in those words. They speak to my soul, and frankly, they speak to this time that we're living through. There's a lot to live up to in those words and those ideas. And I know I personally struggle even coming close to that ideal, because this is the ideal of self-sacrifice and servanthood, living for the benefit of somebody besides myself. And I find in these words a sense of searching and seeking, but also a sense of, of finding what we're really looking for, but finding it in totally unexpected places and ways. And I see here a sense of giving with no thought of receiving. And when I ponder these high ideals and way of life, I naturally think of Jesus Christ. For he's the divine example of an obedient servant, even to the point of death. Jesus was made weak, given infirmity and poverty. He experienced an awful death on a cross, yet he made the greatest impact in all of human history. In the world's eyes, Jesus was a failure, a lowly servant crucified at the height of his acclaim. In God's eyes, and hopefully your eyes and my eyes, Jesus was triumphant, Jesus was victorious, and Jesus changed the world. Now, one of the names given to Jesus, one of the titles given to Jesus is the suffering servant. It was this servant who suffered for us and for our sake that freed you and I from the bondage of our sins. He sacrificed himself for us, and that's what we celebrate, and that's what we remember this coming Holy Week. Now, the prophet Isaiah foretold that a person would come 
Someone would come to suffer for and to save the people. I personally believe he was talking about Jesus Christ. And that you need to realize Isaiah wrote these words 500 years before Jesus showed up and fulfilled every word. And this is what Isaiah wrote, I believe, about Jesus suffering for us on the cross and for our sins 500 years before it took place. This is Isaiah 53, 3 to 10, and then the second half of verse 12. He, I think meaning Jesus, was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, and nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And then verse 12b, For he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. This coming Thursday is Holy Thursday, often called Monday Thursday, wherein we remember Jesus' last supper with his friends, and the very next day he was crucified on Good Friday. And I think there's some lessons to be learned or maybe reminded of as we look at Jesus as the suffering servant, and as we think about him in that way as it relates to Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, Think about that impact on our lives and and our faith and our journey through the difficulties of this time. How does Jesus' suffering servant and dying for our sake help us and impact us? First of all, I think we have to start at the perspective that the suffering servant was innocent of any wrongdoing. Jesus was sinless. Isaiah claims the suffering servant had done no violence and no deceit was in his mouth. And then Peter, much later, writes in the New Testament, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was in his mouth. And when they hurled their insults at Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That was Peter. So Jesus was innocent of any sin or wrongdoing, but whoever took on the sins of the world of each one of us had to be innocent, had to be sinless, for only one without blemish, one without sin, can take on somebody else's sin. Through Jesus, if we accept what he's done for us on the cross and in the resurrection, our sin can be wiped out, it's gone. For Jesus carries it. He takes it on through the suffering on the cross. Being a servant, thinking about suffering servant here, means that you sacrifice yourself, your needs, your desires for the sake of somebody else. And Jesus' whole life was a life of sacrifice, a life of of teaching others, of carrying everybody else's burdens, of challenging others to grow, even dying for your sake and dying for my sake. 
Isaiah talks about the suffering servant bearing our pain, carrying our suffering, taking on our transgression or sin. And Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which we celebrate today, to sacrifice himself for you and for me, for us, to set us right with God, to heal our wounds. Again, going back to Isaiah 53, this is verse 5. For he, meaning Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the word iniquities means sin. The punishment Jesus went through brings us peace, and by Jesus' wounds we are healed. So in other words, the suffering servant took our place. He sacrificed himself so that we might not be sacrificed ourselves. So today, being Palm Sunday, we remember that Jesus entered Jerusalem to accolades and cries of love and Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yet we also need to remember as we look forward into Holy Week that a few days later they yell, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus goes to the cross to save us all. Jesus knew when he entered Jerusalem that day, on that Palm Sunday, what he was entering to do. He knew what was coming in a few short days. You know, at different times in my life, I've had difficulty comprehending and feeling just what Christ's sacrifice really meant and what it means and what did it feel like. So one of the ways that I'm always able to get in touch with the wonder and, frankly, the terror of his death is to realize how I would feel if a friend of mine died in order to save me or somebody else died in order to save me. So I want you to imagine for a minute that um, you're walking down a sidewalk with a friend and you're about to cross a street and you don't hear or see the car coming, but your friend does. And he runs and he pushes you right out of its path but he is killed doing so. How do you feel? Or maybe you're drowning, and a friend swims out to save you, and he does save you, but unfortunately he drowns as a result. How would you feel? Maybe a fellow soldier jumps on a grenade just as it is about to explode, and your life is saved as a result, and his life is lost. How would you feel? Or maybe a healthcare worker takes care of you when you get the coronavirus. You survive, but they get it and they don't survive. How would you feel? I think if we're going to be honest, we'd feel awful. But at the same time, there's this piece of us that would feel grateful. We'd feel guilty, but grateful at the same time. Now, these examples are grossly inadequate. But they help me begin to, to touch and to get a sense of the magnitude of what Christ has done for you and for me. Except for the fact that Jesus goes further. Because he takes on all of everyone's pain and sin and heartache for all time. His sacrifice is for all, not just for one or two. And he goes beyond simply saving a life or a few lives for a few moments to saving us forever. For all time. So I am awestruck and I, I am humbled by what Christ the sovereign servant has done for me and for you and for all. I'm overwhelmed by what he went through just for me and, and what he went through for you. Jesus suffered terribly, but willingly, because he loved us so much and because he wanted us to avoid such suffering later on. So Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, bore the sin of many. And healed us by his sacrifice. He freed us by his caring and he freed us by his love. So the, the piece that comes into play and how it relates to you and me is that followers of Jesus today and every day are called to be Christ's servants in the world. That's where we become, as I, the phrase I use, his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece in the world. We become Christ's servants in the world. We're called to be self-sacrificing so that others can find their way to God. We're called to be giving and to be generous, to share the love of God freely to all we meet, or in this day and age, to all we talk to um, day in and day out. 
whether we're talking to them on social media or through doors or distances, so we keep our social distance, but we're still talking to people and we're still a representative for Jesus Christ. So being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus means that we become a servant and that we get on with the business and the work of the kingdom, that we're to be about the work of binding up the wounds of those who are hurting and those who are confused, and we do it all in Jesus' name not our name. So if we're going to be serious about our faith, we need to get serious about servanthood and God's will for our lives. That's one of the reasons in this time of the coronavirus that we have tried to keep the Tuesday free meal and the Wednesday crew meal going. That's why we, I've encouraged you to adopt others in this uncertain time, people that you could watch over and care for and just kind of keep tabs on in this scary time. Friends, that's why Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. That's why Jesus submitted to the cross on Good Friday to be a servant even to the point of death. And entering Jerusalem that day, Jesus comes to serve you and to serve me by shedding his blood for us five days later on the cross. God in Christ served us by offering salvation to us, offering us eternal life. Now, it says in Genesis that that we are made in the image of God and that when we accept Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our life leader, we're to become like him. Again, we don't become him. We don't become God's. We become like him. That means we're to become a servant. Spending our lives serving God, helping others, not just focusing and centering on ourselves. So if we're able to be servants even part of the time, We'll be able to say what the person I quoted in the beginning of this message, I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered, and I am among all people most richly blessed. I think we have to admit the life of a servant is not easy. It can often be really hard, but there's a lot of joy in it as well. And to be honest with you, it goes against the grain of most of our society. Jesus Christ could not have helped anyone or done any good had he not been a servant. And friends, we, you and I, will not be able to help anyone or do any good if we're not servants as well. Now, in this day and age, we've got to be smart. We have to take our precautions. We have to practice physical distancing, all those things that we talk about. But we're still called to engage with people and figure out creative ways to reach out and to make a difference and, again, to be Jesus' hands and feet and mouthpiece in this time. We're called to help somebody else in this journey. And I believe life is rich and full and exciting working in the service of God. And I think we're going to find the essence of life itself when we learn what it means to be a servant and we learn to give and to think of people beyond ourselves. And as a result of that, we'll be able to say, I am among all people most richly blessed. Not because we have things and stuff. Not because things go back to normal. But because we're hands and feet of Jesus and we've made a difference in somebody else's life along the way. Jesus is our model for that. That's who we're supposed to emulate. So as we celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and his death on the cross this week, let us remember and focus on the why he came. He came to die a brutal death. He came for you, and he came for me, and he came for everybody. He came to serve us in the greatest of all ways. My prayer is is that we'll respond by serving him and all others who cross our path as best we can. We need to figure out how to do that in these times. But the key is figuring out how to do it, not just not doing it. That's not an option. Also, if you haven't intentionally accepted what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross and in the resurrection, I want you to think about ways to get a hold of me. And I would be willing to talk with you and to chat with you a little bit, show you how to become a servant that helps change the world. In Jesus' name, the suffering servant's name. Amen. Friends, it's time for us to move to some communion, so I hope you have that ready. Um, And as we come to communion today, as we come to the table today, I want us to think about the bread and the juice. The bread represents Jesus' body. 
And what we celebrate this week is that Jesus enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to sacrifice up his body, to, bring, to go through an awful, awful experience of suffering so that we can be free of suffering, so that we can have eternal life, so that we can find resurrection on the other end, which we'll talk about next week. And so this bread represents his body. It also represents his suffering. So I want you to think about, before you take the bread today, think about, are you thankful for the suffering that he went through for you and for me? And have you accepted what he's done for you on the cross? The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took the bread. After giving thanks to God, he blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat remembering me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is given for the remission of sin. Whenever you drink of it, drink of it, remembering me. I often refer to the cup as the cup of life. Isn't that what this week is all about? Is providing us life amidst death and loss and scariness. We come to the table because... We're sinners. We come to the table because we need Jesus. We come to the table because we need what he and only he can provide. His blood needs to cover our life and our heart and our journey. And this cup represents that blood. This cup represents his sacrifice, the shedding of his blood. So as you take the bread and as you take the cup today, Think about the price that was paid, the awful price that was paid for your freedom and your salvation. And it's my prayer that you're grateful for it and that you choose to become like Jesus, a servant who wants to make a real difference in the real world. So I encourage you to eat the bread now, drink the cup, to receive all that Jesus Christ has for you and to remember all he has done for you. Friends, will you pray with me? O God, who suffers for us and with us, remind us of just how far you will go for us in order to save us and forgive us and free us and give us abundant life. Because, Lord, you go to the cross and beyond. I pray that truth humbles us and brings us to our knees this week. We are confronted this week with the reality that on Sunday the people proclaimed you king. They cried Hosanna to you as you entered Jerusalem. Yet how easy we change our allegiance and how easy we drift away. For five days later they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Lord, it's our prayer that if we were there we would hope that we wouldn't be like that. That we wouldn't say those things, Hosanna one day and crucify you the next But in so many ways, we do that in real life. We proclaim you King and Lord, but then we forget you and we become selfish and willful and we sin, which necessitates the cross and and you dying to save us and forgive us all over again. For we too are guilty, Lord. We have to come to the table and we have to come to this week recognizing that we are guilty and that we need you to save us. There is no other way. You suffered on the cross for them, but also for us and for our sin and our betrayal and our selfishness and our self-focus. And Lord, I pray that you forgive us, that you forgive me. Your blood covers us and cleans us up and sets things right again. Remind us, Lord, of the high price of forgiveness. That it took the death of you, God Almighty, in the person of Jesus, Humble us and teach us. Draw us to yourself in this time. Lord, in this Holy Week, use us to make a difference in your name and for your sake. Help us to be attentive to our own family's needs, but also to connect with those you have prompted us to adopt in this time of illness and isolation. Lord, we pray for extra special protection for health care workers and those working in grocery stores and other places where the public comes in and out. They're on the front lines of this pandemic, and we pray for special protection for them. 
Keep us mindful of what's really important in this time and what's really not important in this time. Teach us some life lessons that will last beyond this period of isolation. Draw us closer to family and to you in these days. Lord, we want to pray for those on our congregational prayer list. Susan Clapp, Bob Day, Heather and Nate Lyon, Sherry Newman, and the Underwood family. Lord, I thank you for each one. I thank you for giving them life and breath, for walking with them in this time. Lord, I pray you send special people to help them in this time as well and give them opportunities to help somebody else. Gracious God, be with them in their concerns and their worries, their struggles. Some of them are unemployed. A lot of us are unemployed these days. Be with the unemployed as well. Help them to be able to pay their bills as a new month rolls around. But Lord, be with these particular people and just bless them in special ways this week and help them to be a blessing to somebody else. May your sacrifice for us, your suffering for us, speak into our life and our situations this week. May it lead us to gratitude, to grace, to sharing, to love, to ministry, to living it all in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would like to supplement this worship time with some praise music or hymns, we've been doing that each one of these um, online services. There's a couple places and a couple things you can do. I suggest you go to youtube.com, but there's other places as well. Some of the um, Palm Sunday hymns you might want to sing are Hosanna, Laud Hosanna, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. But if you prefer praise songs, or maybe you want to mix those together, Um, Raise a Hallelujah, which is one we used last week. King of Kings, which is Hillsong Worship, which that song kind of goes through the whole life of Jesus and brings us to this particular week and what he's doing. And then Paul Belosh's song, Hosanna, Praise is Rising, is another great one um, for Palm Sunday. As most of you are aware, um, we're not able to come back to -to face-to-face worship um, on Easter like we had planned. So Easter is going to be very different for all of us, probably for the first time in our lives, is we're going to be spending at home, not face-to-face in worship with one another. So next week, we'll offer communion again. Um, So we'll bracket Holy Week with communion at the beginning and communion at the end. We're not offering a Holy Thursday service, Monday Thursday service this week, um, but Adam will continue to do his devotion on Thursday. I'll continue mine on Tuesdays. But as you enter Holy Week in these crazy, unusual times, I want you to know that God is with you. You don't journey alone in this time. And I encourage you to let God lead you, to carry you if need be, to take you to some new places spiritually. God bless your Holy Week. May it deepen your walk with Jesus and each other. Just know that I'm praying for you. Thanks for looking in. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Still